Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Close Reading episode. My name is Josh, and I'm excited to be joined by BRI's resident scholar, Tony Williams. Hey, Tony. Hey, Josh. How are you? I'm doing well. Next. So in today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at some excerpts from the Supreme Court case of U.S. v. Lopez. So this case involved a student bringing a firearm on school grounds, but it's important to note that it was not about the Second Amendment. Instead, it was about the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. So in order to get started, Tony, I'm going to pull up my slide so we can have the text of the Commerce Clause. Um, and I'd appreciate it if you could talk about what exactly the Commerce Clause is and how it relates to the constitutional principle of federalism. Right. Well, as you can see on the screen, the Commerce Clause resides in Article 1, Section 8, and it says Congress shall have the power. So this is Congress. This is the, a national power to re and, and legislative power. And it, it empowers Congress to regulate commerce with foreign nations, with other countries, uh, but among or between the several states and with the Indian tribes. Uh, the most relevant thing I think to say about that, especially regarding U.S. versus Lopez, is that Congress has the authority to regulate com interstate commerce, trade between states, and the states themselves have the power to regulate trade within its borders, okay? Uh, and that's called intrastate, within the state uh, trade. Uh, and how that relates to federalism, uh, federalism itself is the principle that each level of government has certain powers. Uh, and, and they also have some shared powers. And, and, but, uh, so the, the power to regulate interstate commerce would reside with the national government, the power to regulate intrastate trade within the state that would reside in the states. And that is literally an example of federalism, uh, that, that each level of government is exercising its own powers. Great. Yeah, it's essential that we understand the Commerce Clause um, before we, we get into the actual case. Um, so a bit of background on what happened. Uh, Alfonso Lopez was a 12th grade student. He attended Edison High School in San Antonio, Texas. He carried a unloaded revolver and some ammunition onto his school grounds, which uh, school officials were notified about through an anonymous tip. Lopez was arrested and charged with violating a Texas law. However, those charges were dropped and he was later charged with violating federal law, specifically the Gun Free School Zones Act of 1990, which made it a crime to carry a gun on school grounds if you were unauthorized or to have a gun within a thousand feet of school grounds. So in federal district court, that court decided that Lopez did violate that law and that that law was a legitimate exercise um, or a legitimate reading, I should say, of the Commerce Clause. Um, they determined that because education is so connected with commerce, specifically interstate commerce, so it affects the national economy, that the law was constitutional. Now, the case then went to a court of appeals, and they actually ruled the opposite. They said, no, this law is actually unconstitutional. The state should be regulating this. Finally, it went to the Supreme Court, and they ruled in a five to four opinion in favor of Lopez. So. Ultimately, they decided, no, this is an unconstitutional um, law. So we have here some excerpts from Chief Justice William Rehnquist's opinion. Tony, what stands out to you uh, about the wording? What, what does he emphasize here with these quotes? Yeah, and I, I think what Rehnquist is saying here, as I'm reading it, is that 
he's really um, opposed to the way that Congress has, has exercised its, its power to make law under the Commerce Clause for, for the previous 60 years. Uh, he's basically saying, if we accept this law, regulating a handgun possession near a local school or within a local school uh, by the federal government, by Congress, He's basically saying in that last sentence, we're hard pressed to posit any activity by an individual that Congress cannot regulate, right? He's basically saying this is such an expansive reason, uh, reasoning or an, an exercise of, of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause that it basically provides unlimited power to Congress to, to regulate anything, even within the states. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and then we also have here, uh, Justice Thomas wrote a concurring opinion. Um, and he, he echoes that exact same sentiment. Um, this idea that uh, police powers uh, should be left to the states. Now by police powers, uh, we mean um, generally in the past, the states were responsible for regulating things like health, morality and crime three of are of the the broadest examples of police powers and justice thomas here argues that um commerce uh specifically carrying a gun on school grounds uh falls under the state authority of police powers um so we've looked at the the majority and concurring opinion here now let's take a look at the the dissent opinion. Well, well, let, let's get back to Thomas because I, I I think that's actually a really important thing to dial in on. That you know Thomas is basically trying to get at what is commerce, right? Because if Congress has the ability to regulate interstate commerce, then one needs to decide is it actually interstate commerce uh, or whether it's happening within a state. And the really important question is, what is commerce, right? Is, this is true, you know, is, is it trade? Uh, is it, you know, goods and services going across the state line? And what Thomas says is that, you know, carrying a handgun near schools uh, may be a bad idea. Uh, it may have led to people getting hurt, even children getting hurt. But he says, it's just not commerce, right? It's not trade, and it's certainly not trade across the state line, right? Uh, and so he's trying to examine whether the facts of the case, you know, are related to an understanding of what commerce is. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and I and think that's the question, right? Uh, you know, this is you know, somewhat debatable. There's some blurry lines, but the question is, you know, is this interstate commerce? And and Thomas says, by any reasonable interpretation, it's not. Right, yep, and, and that's really the, the heart of the issue where um, the, the two sides disagree is how much can we say that, that education affects commerce? How wide of a sphere do we want to grant it? And obviously, uh, Justice Thomas and the majority argue that um, we we don't want to stretch that too far, and and then the dissenting opinion um, is obviously going to argue that no, this is actually very intertwined. Um, here we have Justice Breyer's opinion: education, although far more than a matter of economics, has long been inextricably intertwined with the nation's economy. So there's such a connection between education and the nation's economy, that co uh, Congress has a legitimate and compelling interest to regulate uh, guns and their, their, sorry, guns specifically on school grounds. Right, and, and, and it seems to me anyway, uh, you know, we can argue about it. Uh, we encourage the, the students and, and teachers to, to debate this, uh, but, you know, the question is, this, this seems to me like a pretty tortured reading uh, of the Commerce Clause. You know, are, are kids going to a local public school 
and learning and, and eating lunch and going to gym class and going about their ordinary day. You know, is that interstate commerce? Uh, I, I know I'm not really seeing it, uh, but and, and so it seems to be pretty tortured. I mean, you'd, you'd really have to make an, an expansive link. And, and I think that's what the majority opinion is, is pointing out is that, you know, it, you'd really have to go sort of 20 steps removed to, to get from, from kids going to a local public school uh, on a Monday or Tuesday uh, and interstate commerce. Sure, yeah. Uh, one thing that also uh, stands out to me about Justice Breyer's opinion is his emphasis on social science. So in this top quote, he talks about reports, hearings, and other readily available literature make clear that the problem of guns in and around school is widespread and extremely serious. So this idea that we're not just going to look uh, to the word of the Constitution, we also need to, to look at studies and see what impact does the issue at hand have on American society. I know that uh, this was this idea of looking at social science is nothing new. Um, it had been used by the court in previous cases. And I know you actually just talked to a scholar, Tony, in a different webinar, which we can link to uh, in the, the description here below, about that idea of, of using social science, specifically in the case of Brown v. Board of Education. So could you talk a bit about what that idea is, what connections are there between specifically maybe Brown and this case? Yeah, you make some great points, Josh, that, uh, you know, these reports, hearings, readily available literature, you know, the, the, the use of social science is, is not something new in the court. Uh, we can go all the way back to the, to the progressive era, the early 1900s with cases like Lochner versus New York uh, and uh, the Brandeis brief in, in 1908, uh, and, and uh, several other cases over a couple of decades, that, that the court starts to get involved in using social science to regulate working hours or child labor uh, and other kinds of social problems that were spawned by industrialization uh, during the progressive era. Uh, and, and the court used that social science in, in determining you know, the outcome of cases. Uh, as Philip Munoz, uh, our good friend, pointed out in, in our uh, discussion, in our scholar talk, you know, the Warren Court, you know, accelerated the, the pace of, of using social science in, in cases, uh, particularly in, in Brown versus Board, and, and there was a famous Dahl study and, and, and other studies that, that it referred to, uh, but, but other cases as well. Uh, most notably, I think, also in, in Roe versus Wade um, with the creation of the trimester system. And so the court has a long history of doing this. And, and I think, uh, you know, as scholars, and, and we encourage teachers and students to do this as well, is to ask questions about that. You know, is that the responsibility of the court uh, to use social science in determining, you know, the outcome of a case, or should it really stick to the constitution so should it stick to the law and and precedent um i think i have no problem with the use of social science by uh by the congress in formulating laws and making laws or the executive branch in terms of making policy uh but those are the political branches and they should hear social science and by the way social science doesn't always agree uh, and so they can, you know, I think very easily and, and appropriately uh, look at different studies and, and look at conflicting ideas about what economists or so social scientists, sociologists, historians are saying about a topic. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's the correct purview uh, of the court's responsibility. Uh, but I think that'll lead to some good grist for uh, discussion uh, in, in the classrooms of our viewers. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's important to note, well, the, the majority opinion definitely places a far stronger emphasis on constitutionalism. We can also see 
some constitutional arguments here. Mm -hmm. Justice Breyer obviously is arguing that this is within the, the legitimate reaches of the Commerce Clause. So um, it's not just social science. He's, he's trying to make a constitutional argument as well. Mm -hmm. And I think Justice uh, David Soder's opinion also echoes that trying to find some connection to the Constitution. We have some quotes here that are, are really emphasizing um, judicial restraint. So this idea that uh, we don't want to legislate from the bench, um, we want to let Congress do that, and then it's our job to determine the constitutionality. Um, it's interesting because generally you hear conservative justices uh, talk more about judicial restraint. But here we have Justice Soter, who is more of a liberal justice, talking about that very concept. Um, so what, what's your take on this, Tony? Well, I think there's a fascinating history behind this, right? Uh, because the court from around the Gilded Age Progressive Era up through the New Deal uh, was typically seen as more conservative, as exercising judicial restraint, uh, not you know, as, as deferring to the political branches in terms of making law and policy. The New Deal, uh, especially around the, the time of the, the court packing plan by FDR, there are changes uh, and becomes more liberal, right? Uh, and uh, it, it exercises the, these powers under the Commerce Clause very expansively uh, from 1937 to U.S. versus Lopez in 95. And uh, conservatives would say that was actually uh, judicial activism uh, by the courts. And, and contrarily, liberals would say the conservatives were uh, acting with, uh, th that they were the ones acting with judicial activism, right? Uh, and now you see this argument again that, that the liberals are attacking the conservatives for, for judicial activism uh, rather than restraint. So we, we've sort of seen ebbs and flows, right? Uh, when you're sort of on the losing end, uh, either liberal or conservative, you accuse the other side of judicial activism and you're the ones acting with restraint. But then when you know, you're know you more in the majority, you'll see yourself acting with, with judicial restraint uh, and, and not acting with judicial activism. Uh, you know, it, it's it's, been an accusation on both sides uh, throughout the course of the 20th century. So we've seen this ebb and flow of, of calls for judicial activism and restraint. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I think that that's, uh, it's really important to keep in mind what you're saying, how, how both sides kind of throw that around. Um, and just from a, a broader lens, one thing that I think is really important to keep in mind as we look at Supreme Court cases is that the Supreme Court is not infallible. They frequently overturn past cases. Um, so that shows us that at some point, someone got it wrong. Um, and we're going to assume that they're going to continue to get it wrong as they, they continue to overturn past cases. Um, and that's where I think it's really essential that we as Americans continue to debate and discuss these cases. The Supreme Court is not the final arbiter of these issues. And while we have an obligation to um, you know, follow the, the rulings that the Supreme Court makes in the spirit of upholding the principle of rule of law, that doesn't mean that we can't disagree and that doesn't mean that we can't discuss these issues. Um, one other important thing that I think we should keep in mind here is, especially in a time of polarization, just trying to find the, the common language that both sides use. So specifically, federalism and judicial restraint stood out to me here, as both sides talk about it, and it seems like both sides think it's an important principle and it really just comes down to different interpretations of how much weight should we give um, the states, how much weight should we give the federal government in making these decisions. And then of course, like you said, both sides like to accuse the other. 
of partaking in judicial activism. So it's obviously, it seems like Americans don't like judicial activism. So I think that's just important to keep in mind that, you know, while we might be polarized, we do have disagreements and they're important disagreements. There's still this common language. That, that's a great point. And it reminds me all the way back in, in history, back to the debate between Hamilton and Jefferson over the National Bank, right? Uh, Hamilton proposed the National Bank and, uh, you know, Washington and the cabinet weren't sure about it. Uh, Washington solicits his opinions from, from the other cabinet officers and, and then eventually, you know, makes up his mind. Uh, Congress passes the bill. Uh, and Washington signs it, and eventually the court will say it's constitutional in McCullough v. Maryland. But there was a fierce debate, and, and what I love about that debate is that it was constitutional, right? Uh, that they both looked to the necessary and proper clause in Article 1, Section 8. Uh, they both looked throughout Article 1, Section 8 for the powers to establish a bank, and they had different interpretations of it. Uh, Hamilton said, read it expansively and, and, and said that the, the necessary and proper clause allows a, b a bank. And Jefferson read it a little more restrictively and said, no, Congress doesn't have that power. And, and, and that's the amazing thing about the American Republic is that different people can, can look at an issue, a constitutional issue, and come to different conclusions, right? And as citizens, we need to read each of those different opinions uh, and formulate our own ideas about who is right. Uh, and you're right, the court, Congress, the, the president, they won't always get every decision right, uh, but it's proper to have that debate within the, within the confines of constitutionalism and, and American principles. That makes for a healthy, vigorous debate, even when we disagree a little bit. Definitely. Well, Tony, it was great having you on. I really enjoyed talking about this case with you. Right. I, I loved it too, Josh. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, it, it's a fascinating and, and very important case to, to talk about with teachers and students in their classrooms. So uh, I, I think it's a great conversation. Definitely. And we are going to be having a homework help video on the case of USB Lopez released, which can be linked below here in the description. So be sure to check that out if you'd like. Um, further uh, information on the details of the case to share with your students. Uh, until the next episode, thank you so much for tuning in.